Hi, welcome to the Sustainable Living Guides class on building a palatable cabin. I am Miguel Elliott, your guide on this journey, and I am very pleased to have this opportunity to help you navigate through the process of building your own little palatable cabin. So, I am here on my farm in Sebastopol, California. This is uh, my little kitchen. Uh, that back there is my little sleeping pod. And these are all built out of pallets. Pallets insulated with straw covered in an earthen plaster, right? So I am uh, just, I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, this is the technique that I have found that works for me in building my little houses. So how did I get started on this journey? So uh, I've been building for over 25 years since the mid 90s. And uh, I've worked on building a lot of adobe houses and cob, you know, just a mixture of sand, clay, and straw, uh, straw bale, wattle and daub, a lot of different techniques. And I have uh, come to the conclusion for myself that building with the pallets insulated with straw covered in an earthen plaster is uh, the fastest technique that I've found to build little houses. So uh, this is the technique that I'm going to be sharing with you. So, uh, yeah, so I've built many of these. Um, let's see, I've built probably about 12 of them now. Um, most notably, um, a few years ago, I built one at the Solar Living Center in Hopland. We call that the, the Hobbit Hut. And then I also built a couple at, the, uh, at a retreat center. Um, one was the Hobbit Hut. Another one was a gingerbread hut. And uh, we rent those out on Airbnb. They're very popular. And then I did one in Petaluma. We call it the Ga Ganesh Cabin because we have a, a, an elephant sculpted on the side. And, and that's uh, for a farm worker to stay in. And, uh, and then I built one for this fella, John, who was writing a book. And so he wanted a nice little hut to write his book in. So I did one for him. And, uh, and then I did one for um, a couple ladies and their kids. Um, we call it the Cobb Cedral. And, um, and it's for a space for the, the boys uh, to practice their instruments in and the, the um, parents to do counseling for some of their clients. And then I did one for a, uh, a couple and their family um, for, uh, for the couple to do yoga and meditation and the kids to do some of their uh, classes, online classes inside. And then uh, another one I did in the town of Occidental um, in on a farm and the farm worker is staying there and uh and so and currently i'm working down in oakland uh building some palatable cabins at a homeless encampment underneath the freeway so we built a kitchen we're building a clinic we built a compost and toilet and uh and we're going to be building a free store and, and an art space and some other little habitable uh cabins also so um, let's begin this journey together. Um, in this process, we will be seeing different examples of, uh, of different structures that I've been working on. And so you'll, we'll be seeing uh, different phases um, of the building process, and we'll be featuring different structures that I've worked on. So you can see um, you know, the different applications of these techniques in these different um, structures. So let's go on this journey together. I hope that you find this very beneficial to your learning experience and um, and let's have a good time together. Okay, let's begin our first palatable cabin. I'm pretty sure that of all the different natural building techniques this is the most affordable, the fastest, the easiest style technique for super low cost housing. Um, I think it's a great solution. Uh, I call it a palatable cabin, right? A palatable cabin, um, often because it's a living roof. I put uh, edibles on the roof, um, but it's also it's built out of uh, pallets. Uh, so, uh, so it's pallets. Pallets are free. 
It's estimated that over you know, 20 million pallets are thrown away every year, and the pallets offer a perfect receptacle for the insulation. So instead of doing conventional construction that uses a lot of cement, uh, you know, these two by sixes, Insulated with fiberglass insulation, covered in drywall, OSB, Tyvex, paint, um, wood siding, all this stuff that's uh, toxic um, and costs a lot of money. Um, we're just using recycled wood, pallets, straw. You can also use plastic as an insulation. I think that's a great idea as an insulation material. Cardboard, um, old fibers, um, hemp you could use. Um, and then you cover it in your earthen plaster. And, uh, and it, it's like, it's contained, it is beautiful and, and, uh, and you can make it whatever color too. You know, this will probably, once it dries, we're going to do a nice earthen plaster over this and make it nice and smooth and everything. And, uh, so, um, yeah, so, um, it, it's, it's great also for doing work parties, you know, so we can have people come over and help out. Um, you know, it's, it's great for work parties because it really doesn't take very much skill to, to make the cob and then to put it on the wall. We could have kids here, you know, we could have school groups coming. We could have people with uh, you know, addictions, with disabilities, elderly. Um, I, I think it's a very therapeutic uh, process to, 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 do, to do cob, an earthen building. Um, you know, it's just, and it grounds the body. Being barefoot grounded to the earth is one of the healthiest things you can do for yourself. So, uh, so I'm really excited to, to share uh, this, this kind of building. And I've actually worked with an engineer to have these palatable cabins designed to code, right? So I do have the engineer drawings to have these. It's a, a lot more cement, wood, and steel than I think is necessary, but it also has a living roof. Um, and so it's to accommodate that. So you're ready to build yourself a little palatable cabin. Great. So you have identified the space where you want to build. And I would recommend, if possible, to try to build on a, um, a flat land. And if, uh, if you are building on the bottom of a slope, to, to try to create a good drainage. You want drainage going around your structure, okay? So if, you're, if it's flat, you want to build it up with base rock. So let's take a look um, at the way that that is done. Okay, we are starting a new cabin project here in Santa Rosa. So we're in day one. So we're in the backyard. Um, and uh, so um, I just thought I would share with you the process of how we do the layout of a small cabin. So this will be a cabin for meditation, yoga, Jennifer, she wants a nice space to do her yoga. Michael wants a nice space to do his meditation and kind of get away. He's got four kids and they want to, you know, just have a little getaway space. So what the first thing you want to do is you want to find your center point. And so we wanted to have the door right here, right? So the door is going to be right here. And so, so this is kind of like the center of the door. So I put, so we're going to be using um, pallets. This will be a palatable cabin. So we're going to have uh, 40 inch pallets. So I'm going to use four by fours and I'll be putting the four by fours every 40 inches apart, right? So I made, I found my center point here and then came out and I found that it's about 68 inches from the center to out here, right? 68 inches from out here going around and I made a circle using my spray paint, you know, just kind of going around in a circle. And now, and then I put, um, you know, little four by four blocks every um, 40 inches, right? So this being, this one at the door, this one the door, and then this is another uh, up right here. And so it went around and it pretty much worked out perfectly. So we have 10 uprights going around in a circle. Right, every 40 inches. Okay, so that's great. So now we can go ahead and start removing some of the topsoil. Right, so I'm just going to take up the first couple inches of topsoil of the grass of the, the loose stuff. So that'll just you know, take take a little bit of time, and then I'll replace that with base rock. So I'll get a couple yards of base rock, bring that in and create kind of a mound of base rock, probably about three inches 
going from here and going out. Tamp that really good, and then make my my holes. I'll I'll get a uh, my my uh, fence post hole digger and make my holes, and then put my uh, four by fours in there, and, uh, and then let those set up overnight. And then tomorrow we can start putting our our pallets in, filling it with straw, and uh, and then doing all the fun decorative sculpting. So that's where we're at. So, well, So, uh, first thing I did is I put the base rock in and worked on leveling it out. It was considerably higher here, so I put in, you know, a good six inches or so here to make this level, and you will know, be tamping that down. When you measure this, you measure it from, from here, from the inside corner to this inside corner, right? So you measure it from here to here. And so now we're pretty much ready to start making our holes, uh, making our holes. We're going to be setting these in concrete. Um, you can use pier blocks also, but I think uh, in this case, uh, just setting the uh, uprights in, in concrete in the ground, this makes more sense. So now that you have ha put your uh, base rock down and you have a nice level, flat, hard surface to work with, now you're ready to make your holes in the ground, okay? So I usually use a digging bar, right? So uh, I use a digging bar and a, a fence post hole digger, and I usually go about 20 inches, uh, you can go two feet deep. And uh, so I, I make a hole in the ground, make some concrete mix, add with water, put that in the hole, put the post in there, and then um, pack the concrete around the post. And I do that every 40 inches. If you have the pallets, the 40 inch pallets that you wanna use, you can actually go ahead and put those in position, um, you know, with a, a four by four on the ground in between, just so that the pallets are exactly uh, in position to the four by four post, okay? So that's an option, um, or you can just measure very clearly. So let's take a look at how to set the posts um, in the ground and um, in the position that they need to be. Um, so first thing we did was was we um, made uh, put our put our posts in the ground, right? So we have our posts every forty inches apart, right? So pretty much um, we had our center point here. And, um, and it's pretty much worked exactly to about 70 inches from the center point out to here to make it so that you can have 10 uprights 40 inches apart, right? So the 40 inches so that we can put our 40 inch pallets in between, right? So got all that in there. So we went ahead and set those in concrete. And, um, and we're using the, the, we're not using pressure treated wood. We're using, we're putting the, the copper um, stuff on there, copper green, um, and that helps to protect the, the, the wood um, from, the, from rotting. And so we take the, the topsoil away, we take you know the first layer of topsoil away. So first thing we'll do tomorrow is put some gopher wire down and then put um, the base rock, we'll get, I'll get a couple yards of base rock and, and mound that base rock. So we'll be putting about four inches or so of base rock um, down over this, maybe a little more. And, uh, and then just put a membrane, like a plastic membrane, between the wood and the pallets. That's what we'll probably do. So now that you have your posts in the ground, we're ready to put our pallets uh, on the posts. So um, as I'll be showing in this video, you have to prep the back sides of the pallets, right? Most pallets are missing some slats on the back side. So I usually get some 2 by 4s and put those on either side, the, the, the part that's indented on the pallet, put a two by four there and then put a nice wooden slat. And you don't want the spaces in between the pallets to be much more than two inches. If it's any more than two inches, it's just, it's gonna be hard for the cob to stick to it. So if, if it's more than two inches, if you can just get like a thin piece of wood and just put that across, um, you'll find that that makes things a lot easier. So let's take a look at putting the pallet to the upright. Okay, so Alex is working on putting these pallets in here. 
So we've gotten these ones in. How fast would you say we got these in? Uh, half an hour? Half hour? I know, huh? That's about right. It goes super quick. So now we're pretty much ready to start putting the straw in there. So, and we have different heights because there'll be a window here and a nice window here. Then we'll be putting like a star, um, a bottle star there and and like, uh, you know, stained glass or some kind of nice feature there. So we just have these three spaces to fill in here with the pallets. And we'll be done for the, in the day. It's going to be raining this weekend, so we're going to hold off on putting the straw in there until we have a nice week of sunshine. Okay. So now we've seen the technique of attaching the pallet to the uprights when uprights are set into the ground, into concrete. Let's take a look at another way of doing it, which is on pier blocks. You can also set 10 pier blocks around in a circle and set your uprights on top of that. So let's take a look at that now. So, um, so this here is where I'm at now. Uh, so we have our uh, pier block um, and we have our concrete blocks, nice level surface. This is as simple as this. I just get pier blocks. It's been proven that pier blocks is actually better in an earthquake than if it's in the that's poster in the ground. It actually in an earthquake it would bounce more than sway, and actually that makes it stronger in an earthquake. And I and, and another advantage too is that then I don't have to use pressure treated wood. I can just you know uh, use regular recycled wood, and then um, and then I you know just screw my pallets right to my four x four. Once I have it all framed in, it's super strong. It, it doesn't move at all. I mean, it's like super solid. And uh, and then I'll be putting the cob over all this. It'll be an earthen floor. We'll be putting about um, three and a half inches of earth on the floor, and that'll feel really nice on the feet. So we'll go ahead and take this pallet. I've been working on. Um, one of the big uh, things you have to do with these pallets is to prep them, right? Because, you know, the pallets are always missing uh, a couple slats. So I've been spending some time filling in the slats um, so that they're full, you know, on both sides. Um, and that just involves, you know, putting some like two by fours on the sides and then filling that in. So now it's all ready. And also it was a four foot, most pallets are four feet, so I cut a foot off uh, to make it 36 inches. So I'll put this right here. And start attaching our pallet to our upright. Okay, so we got that in, and now I can go ahead and put in this upright. Okay, so now that we have our pallets all in, attached to the uprights, now we're ready to start insulating, right? So when you have your first course of pallets in, that's when you want to put your insulation in before you put your windows and your shelves and everything in. Okay, so that's pretty important because it's going to be very hard to, to pack it in to the pallets uh, once you have the shelves and the windows in. So uh, as you'll see in the video, you can use straw. That's what I usually use. Usually rice straw works great or wheat straw. Um, you know, so taking the straw, packing that into the pallet is great. Uh, you can also use foam if you have access to foam. I've used that, like roofing companies often have foam that they're just giving away. Um, you know, you can use clothes, you can use cardboard, uh, you can use wool. So I'll be showing you a few different techniques um, and uh, materials that you can use for insulating your walls, right? And of course the insulation is to help to retain the heat that's generated inside the structure. And uh, that's one of the advantages of these palatable cabins is that they actually have insulation. Whereas a cob house or an adobe house, it's not very well insulated uh, from the cold. It might be insulated from the heat, but not so much from the cold. And so I find that these palatable cabins um, you know, are very well insulated uh, from, from the cold. So 
let's check it out. Now we're putting our uh, straw or insulation in here. And what's actually really cool about this is you can pretty much just take a, a flake of straw and just go ahead and just put that right in there. Right? It's like it works. It works it's a per perfect fit. <clears throat> We are using wool um, to insulate our coven. All right, so we have the sheep right over there that just got sheared. And so uh, we can just, you know, straw works great. Um, and any kind of lightweight fiber like this works great too. So we can just go ahead and just take our, our wool and put it right in there. You know, so you can also use clothes. You can always use old sleeping bags. You know, it doesn't have to be a fiberglass insulation. You know, you can use you know, natural fibers like this. And uh, the animals can be making their contribution to the property, the cabin. So that's the idea. So we'll go ahead and just fill in this whole panel here. Okay, now you're gonna get a little peek at the project that I'm doing down in Oakland where we are building little structures for the homeless under a freeway and we are using the trash that's readily available um, surrounding the site to insulate the walls. So, let's take a look. All right, so you can see here, like, so cardboard like this, you can take cardboard, roll it up like this, and then start that inside the house. All right, so really the best insulation is when there's, you know, little, little air in the gap, you know? So you do want to, you know, kind of scrunch it up, you know, pretty tight. And, uh, so, you know, but all this kind of stuff, this all works as an insulation material. So you put this right in there, and then we use this to tamp it down. So now that we have our walls all insulated, now we are ready to start playing around with some of our shelves and windows. Okay, so for the for the I like to do shelves. I usually get a, a two by twelve, some old scrap two by twelves, um, or a plywood, and I'll set that on top of the pallet. And I like to cut the corners of the wood so you have nice rounded um, shelves, right? And so I'll usually put a a 2 by 12 for the lower part and then I'll put a 2 by 12 in the middle and on the sides and then I'll put another 2 by 12 on top of that, right? Um, so for the shelves and uh, and for if you have access to glass blocks, glass blocks can be a really really great feature for the palatable cabin and I just happen to have a friend who has lots and lots of these extra glass blocks that um, I'm able to use. So uh, So I find the glass blocks uh, works really well with this and if you have access to stained glass if you can go to a stained glass shop and use stained glass um, You know that can be a really nice addition to the cabin uh, So that's another one of the advantages of the palatable cabin is that you're able to embed the shell have the shelves uh, framed in and uh, Your glass blocks and your stained glass and bottles uh, It's just a lot easier to work those features in than uh, with a, uh, a cob structure or an adobe or a straw bale. Okay, so uh, so the framing is up to you. You know the, what the design that you want. Uh, you know uh, that that's that's all your creative liberty. And the windows, I usually will the the windows. I usually will get the windows less than 40 inches. So I usually use like a 36 inch window, and and put that on. Um, in between the pallets, and I then I'll put a, a two by four on either side, right, and just kind of frame that in, and then um, and then I like to put uh, arch out the windows with plywood, and I'll just cut a piece of plywood and and make an arch with that, and then I'll put my cob over that. So we'll be seeing that also. So let's check out the framing. So we are making progress on our little top of the hut here, and. Um, so we are working now on uh, just kind of framing it all out, right? So we've been kind of just playing around with putting the, I put these bottles in today. All right, so these covered bottles, and um, so I'm gonna start. I'm gonna get a plywood and arch that out, and uh, I'm about to start a bottle star right here, 
right? So similar to how I just did this, we just had this, we got, we got the chicken wire. We put chicken wire um, around the, uh, the plywood and the shelves and upside down, you know. Cool. So we are now in the exciting phase of starting to do some of the cobbing. So um, we're doing this first uh, bottle star. And uh, so I'll just kind of share with you what I'm doing. So as a mortar, a cob mix, I'm using this earth, actually just right from the properties, is uh, the earth and sand and straw. And so I added some sand, some straw, mix it up. And I'm using uh, some adobe bricks. These are, you know, cob adobe bricks that I made at my house. And so I'm using these as kind of like this, all right? And, uh, and so, um, so, yeah, so I'm using these bottles. I use my, um, my grinder, you know, my Makita grinder to just kind of chop off the, the top. Then I put some tape in there so the cob won't cur uh, cause, uh, you know, um, moisture to develop. There won't be any condensation. And so, yeah, so we've kind of put, do this in phases. All right, so I, I do this part first, let this set up, and then uh, when I come back, I'll finish putting the bottles here, and here, and here, and um, and I got this this nice stained glass in today. I'll be putting uh, some of these bottles in. I haven't decided the orientation, but some of these nice bottles here, maybe at an angle. You know, it's one of the great things about Cob as you can kind of design design as you go along, and um, so and I'll put some nice nice bottles in here along the side of the windows. Um, so uh, yeah, so we're still kind of framing, and then um, hopefully once it gets it all framed in, then we'll have our work party mingo and we'll get a get it all cobbed up. So yay. So now we are ready to make our cob mix. So, uh, you know, you can use a, a mud box to mix it up. A lot of people will use a tarp, um, you know, and mix up the sand and the clay and the straw and the tarp and dance on it. Um, that's actually what most people do. I just been using a mud box for a long time. I find it is very uh, helpful to keep all the material contained. And, um, you know, you can buy one at a landscaping supply shop for about a hundred bucks. And, um, I've, you know, I've been using it for years and I find that it really helps a lot. And, um, and if you're doing a big project, you can also use a tractor. You can use a tractor and mix it up that way. And, uh, you know, I just like to get my hands and the feet in there. And, um, and these palatable cobbins don't use a whole lot of material, right? They don't use a whole lot of cob material because you're only putting like an inch of earth and plaster on either side so it's it's uh, for one of these it's probably about uh, two yards of sand maybe three yards of sand to one yard of clay is all it really takes to to build one of these okay all right, so look at this so we're just using this earth right from here right we're just getting this earth I did a little shake test here and so you can um, see how much sand is in the earth that you're working with, you know? And so you can see here, if you get a close up, you can see it's about 50% sand, 50% clay, right? You want it to be about 70% sand, and so I'm adding about 20% sand to the mix to make it 70% sand, right? So, uh, so it's a great mix though. And I'm just mixing it up right here with my feet doing the, the cob stomp. And I like to use a mud box just because it kind of contains the mix. You can also use a tarp too. And, uh, and so this here, this is my, my ball. So actually, yeah, so this here, this is a cob ball. So um, technically you wouldn't really call this structure a cob structure. In old, in old England, there was old cob houses built over 500 years ago. They're still being lived in all out of cob, right? So the word cob actually means a rounded lump of mass, right? So people would be stomping on the, the, the earth, making these round balls and they'd throw them up to the people standing on the walls and they'd be like 18 inch thick walls and they'd put the cob balls in there and then let it dry in the sun and it would plaster it, do a lime wash plaster. And, um, and so these cob structures are enormous. There's um, the, all the mansions and the peasants, they were all built out of cob. 
Okay, so now that we have made our cob mix, now we are ready to start putting it on the palate. Now, to make it stick to the palate, I'll sometimes make the cob mix a little on the sticky side, right? So I'll sometimes make it like maybe 60% sand, 40% clay. And and when it dries, when it when it dries, it'll it'll crack a little bit. And that's okay. Like pretty much every time I've ever done this, the cob on the palate does crack, okay? But I don't get concerned about that because I'll be plastering over the palate, uh, over the cob when it's all dry, okay? So don't be concerned if when it dries, it starts cracking a little bit. And so that's gonna happen. And, um, and so you're gonna make it stick to the wall. You don't need any kind of chicken wire over the pallet. You can just make a clay slip, just make clay and water, make it into a slurry and use that, sponge that onto the pallet to make it stick to the wall, okay? So let's check out how to put the cob on the pallet. Yeah, so let me just show you here the process of doing one of these. I like to wear gloves. I find that it's a little easier to decob with gloves on. So um, it just gives it a little bit smoother. And So I'm gonna go ahead and put these gloves on here. And then, uh, so I first, I put a clay slip on the pallets. Yeah, and this is just clay, clay and water, just kind of a clay milkshakey consistency. And then I get my cob mix and put it on. Put it on about a about a hat, about an inch thick over the pallets. And you can see the electrical. We just you know put the electrical right there. We're just cobbing right over the electrical line. And uh, so I get it on there. It doesn't have to go on real smooth. It just you know just has to get on. And, uh, and this mix here, I made a little on the sticky side. It might be 60% sand, 40% clay, so that it sticks really easily to the pallets. So I don't have to use any kind of chicken wire or anything to make it stick. So I get it on there, and then and then I'll smooth it out. All right, like that. So you see how fast that is? And so I can probably get this whole pallet cobbed in maybe five minutes. So, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, I mean, it goes so fast. Um, what goes a little slower is all this intricate work and everything here too. Okay, so you saw how to put the cob on the pallets. Now let's take a look at how we put the cob over the arches, okay? And the shelves and things. Um, I usually don't cob the underside of the shelves. Uh, I'll usually just leave those bare. Um, so, but that's up to you. And you can also leave the wood, if you wanna have nice wooden shelves, you don't have to cob the shelves. You can get some nice wood, um, sand it and stain it as you like, and you can have some nice wooden shelves. I, I just like cob so much that I just go ahead and cob it. So, um, yeah, so it basically, and for the arching out the doors, um, you know, I just use plywood to create an arch, and, uh, and then I, I do use chicken wire or like a, um, aviary wire or hardware cloth and staple that to the plywood uh, before putting my clay slip and cob on. So, so let's check that out. All right. So I'm working on this right here. I'm putting the, the cob over the window. So you can see I put chicken wire on first. I put chicken wire over the wood and then um, a clay slip and you know kind of a clay milkshake glue. And now I just take my 
my cob and put it right the um, the wood <coughs> all right like that and then I'll dip my hands in the water and smooth it out all right. so I'll be doing that I'll put you know it, the cob all in between the wood um, we're not having to put any wire on this wood because it's an old rough wood. You know, you see this here, this, you see how rough this old wood was? So we didn't have to put any wire around this at all. Okay, so now the cob has dried for a couple weeks. You want to make sure that the cob on the pallets is all the way dry before plastering it. So. You have a couple options of uh, how to plaster your structure. So usually for the inside, the interior, I do an earthen plaster. And, uh, and so you'll see um, how I make that. And for the outside, I do a lime plaster. Okay. So, but sometimes I do a lime plaster also on the inside. And that's fine. You, you have the option. Um, both are great. Um, I've even done just a lime wash over the earthen plaster on the inside and that has actually worked fine also. Um, so uh, yeah, so you have a couple options. So uh, yeah. Alright, so let's take a look at that. So we are now in the very exciting phase of starting to plaster our cabin here. So, uh, before I proceed, I just wanted to let you know um, how to make an earthen plaster for a uh, little cob hut like this. So the first thing you need to do is you find a good source of earth, right? So I found some really nice red clay in Occidental, um, very near here. And um, so I got that, just dug it right out of the ground. Um, I put it through the screen right here. I, did, I, got, I soaked it in the water and then I put it through the screen and screened it out and uh, you know, screened out the rocks and some of the, the roots and things, you know. And, uh, and so, then, um, so then I put it into my box and, um, and the earth here, and the earth, I did a little shake test and the earth has some sand in it. So it has about, like the sand is about right here and then this is the clay. So it seems to have about 40% sand already in the earth that I'm working with. So I added about 30% sand to make it 70% sand, 30% clay, right? And uh, so I did that and then I added some flour paste. So I made some flour paste. This is just flour and water kind of boiled together, like six parts water, one part flour boiled together. And that just helps to make it sticky. So you're not relying on the, the clay for the stickiness because you don't want this tarp to crack. So it's that and then I got some straw, some rice straw, and put it through a leaf shredder um, and just got it, you know, small, small little pieces so it's all nice and chopped and this helps to give it tensile strength. And uh, so then, yeah, so then I just mix that all together and uh, you know, mix it with the hoe and with my, my feet. So doing the earthen plaster is a great opportunity to have friends over uh, and help out with that process. Um, you know, it's a great work party activity. Uh, another word for work party is minga, right? La minga. It's a South American word for work party. And so a lot can be done during a minga. So this is a, a little uh, work party that we were doing inside of the uh, writing studio. Uh, where a friend was playing the flute and some friends were, were doing the plastering and uh, so check it out. So doing a earthen plaster is a really great activity to do with friends to come over. It's great to have somebody play music while you're working. And so this is just the process of putting on the earthen plaster uh, over the walls. I'm using a, a yogurt lid to kind of smooth it out, right? It's called, it's called burnishing. And so this can be a very peaceful, relaxing, meditative activity.
so we have done our plastering on our walls and now we are ready to do the floor okay so um, I love doing earthen floors they're fantastic um, but what's really important with the earthen floor is that there's no moisture wicking up okay you don't want there to ever be any mold or anything like that in your floor so a couple of different ways of protecting your floor from any moisture um, you have kind of two options you, um, you, you'll have really good drainage, right? You don't want any water from, say, a hillside coming down and getting underneath. So if, you, if you're on a hill, you want to make sure you have a good French drain going around so any water gets diverted, okay? And, um, and so you can use base rock. Um, base rock, I usually do a combination of base rock and drain rock, right? So, um, you know, maybe six inches of that. So no water can come up through that. Um, you can also use a membrane. You can also use a plastic membrane and then do your earthen floor over that. And, and that also works too. And I have had success with that. It's just, of course, the disadvantage of that is that then you're kind of insulating yourself from the earth. Um, you know, you, 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 know, you don't benefit from the, um, the earthing. Um, You know the disadvantage of putting a membrane down is that then you don't uh, benefit from the potential of the earth um, grounding the the bare feet on the floor, which is a really nice feature. Um, so, but you know it does help from mold wicking up and uh, water wicking up and, and causing mold. Hey there. So I am now doing the floor of our cabin. And uh, so I thought it'd be good to share with you the process of doing a cob floor, right? Because it's, um, it's a pretty great thing to have this earthen floor. So, um, so the first thing that um, I did was I worked on leveling it out, right? So I leveled out the whole floor with base rock, right? And, um, and then I'm using these screeds, these one and a half inch, you know, wooden screeds. So these are what I'm using to, um, you know, to kind of create the height of the floor. I'm going to keep it all level. First what I do is I get the floor, the knee pads are very helpful here, and uh, so then I just go ahead and take this cob and press it down. So this cob is pretty dense, it's a pretty dense mix, right, so this is about 70% sand, 30% clay, right, and a fair amount of straw in it too, and um, so and I made it you know, pretty dense so that it'll dry faster and it compact well. So I just go ahead and press this in. And areas that are low, you can go ahead and fill in. Okay, and then pretty much as soon as you can, as soon as you finish this section, you can take this, you take this screed up, and you can go ahead and fill that in. Actually first I want to get this wet. Yep. And then you can go ahead and fill this screed in with the cob. You know if you wait too long to do this then you'll um, you'll have cracking in your joint in your kind of in these uh, screed places. Because we're not doing expansion joints on this, you know, like you would in concrete. Yep. And then you can just go ahead and smooth that out with your float. Okay, and I just want to say some things about a lime plaster, okay? So you have really two options for a lime plaster. There's hydraulic lime which is what I use um, here in Petaluma, California. There's a company called Transmineral that um, distributes this uh, hydraulic lime plaster. It actually comes from France, um, but it works very, very well. It sets in water, so water actually makes it stronger. Um, it is more expensive than the hydrated lime. It's about $45 for a bag, opposed to, say, $12 a bag for the hydraulic lime. Um, but I just find that it works really, really, very well. Um, so the hydraulic lime, that's the type S lime that you would get at most 
uh, hardware stores, Home Depots have it and things like that. Uh, it's also called Miracle Lime. And, uh, and so with that, that also works too. I've, I've done many, many projects with a hydrated lime and it, it does work well. I just find not as well as the hydraulic. Um, hydrated, it sets in air opposed to setting in water. And, um, you know, a lot of people will slake the lime before using it. They insist that they have to slake, you know, soak the lime in water for three months before using it. I have not seen the need for doing that myself. I, I've done lime plaster projects without slaking and they've been absolutely fine. So, um, yeah, so, th so that, that's my experience. And so, so again, I usually do a lime plaster on the outside and an earthen plaster on the inside, but sometimes I do a lime plaster um, on the inside too. And uh, so, let's take a look. So we are now in the exciting phase of plastering our little cob in here. So I thought I'd show you the process of what we're doing. So we're using a, a lime plaster, right? So this is the, the lime plaster that we're using. Um, yeah, on the back here it says used since 30 BC, right? So this is like what the ancient Romans were using a whole long time ago. So it actually, it's hydraulic, so it actually strengthens with water, right? So water actually makes it stronger. And uh, so it's three parts sand, one part lime, and I put some oxide in there. Some, um, some iron oxide uh, comes from a company called Calstone Tan. So here I'll show you um, how I put it on here. So I first get some lime and water, it's kind of a, it's called a lime wash, and I put that over the, over the cob, and so this cob has all been drying for a good week or so, and then I take my plaster mix and just put it on with my hands. And I get it on there about a, about a quarter a quarter, quarter of an inch thick or so. So I just get it on. And then to smooth it out then, I use a, um, a little plastic lid, like a little plastic lid here, to just kind of smooth it out. And then I'll let this sit for about five minutes and then I'll burnish it. I'll press in further and get it nice and smooth like I did yesterday. And so now I'm having fun putting the lime on the wall. So I first put on a lime wash, you know, just a lime and water mixture over the cob. And then I use uh, what's called a, a hawk and a trowel to smear the plaster onto the wall. And it goes on about a quarter inch thick, right? And so I just, I put it on in upwards motions. And then once I get it on there, then I... I smooth out some of the ridges that are caused uh, from the trowel with a little yogurt plastic lid. Um, and I just kind of smooth that out. And so then I do it in sections, right? So then I do the next section and I put on the lime wash. And again, I use the, put the plaster on the hawk and then smear it on uh, with the trowel. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at how to do a lime wash, okay? So I often do a lime wash over the lime plaster, and I find that just gets it extra smooth, and, um, and I do a lot of different colors. I'll do like colors around the windows and around the, the door frames, and so when you have a lime wash, you're able to do a really nice clean cut between the colors of the, the window frames and the walls. And, uh, and so I usually do a couple coats of the lime wash. And so we can take a look at that. And for the, for the color of the, the, uh, the window frames and everything too, uh, for that I usually use, uh, put, do linseed oil. I'll usually put an iron oxide into the linseed oil, mix that up, and that's how I get my brown color. Like this brown color that you see behind me on this tree, that, that's how that was made. Um, okay. Okay, so now I'm doing the um, a lime wash over the lime plaster. So um, just thought I'd share with you the process. So what I'm doing is um, I'm using this lime. I'm using uh, the hydraulic lime from Saint Dacia. So I add that 
and water. So I add about um, I added about uh, four cups of the lime powder to about a, a half of a bucket of uh, water, and I added this um, oxide, this brown iron oxide, right? So it's kind of it's for stucco, but it could also be for a, a lime plaster. I got this from uh, Transmineral also, and I had just a little bit of linseed oil, just just a little bit, maybe maybe a quarter cup or something, just a little bit. And uh, so what I'm yeah, so I just uh, basically just paint it right on. But first, first I want to get the wall wet, right? So the the lime, this hydraulic lime, actually strengthens with water, right? So water actually makes it stronger. So I get the wall a little bit wet first. And I'm going to go ahead and spray what I just did. I just did all this. So I'm going to go ahead and give that a spray too, a little mist. So I'll be kind of doing that throughout the day. And then, uh, and then I just take my, my paint. And this is basically the consistency here is um, it's a little bit thinner than a regular latex paint. It's, um, you know, just, but, it's, uh, but it still does have some substance to it. And so I just take this and paint it on. All right, so I'll do sideways and upways and then sideways. That's kind of my technique that I like to do. Okay, so now we are ready for the roof. Uh, roofs are difficult. Round roofs are difficult for a cabin. So just to let you know, uh, if you want it to be easier, then you might want to go ahead and do a square or rectangular structure. That's a whole lot easier than doing a round roof. Okay, so there will be some things you'll just have to figure out for yourself for doing a round roof. So there's certain angles um, that make it tricky. Um, but I'm just I'll share some uh, some tricks that I have found. Um, I always do a center hub, right? So if you're doing a 10-sided structure, if you have 10 uprights, then you usually want to have like a 10-sided, uh, it's called a decagon, um, ring uh, to put your skylight onto. Um, I've used 8-sided and that just makes it really complicated. Very strange cut when you have an 8-sided hub over a 10-sided uh, building. So uh, I highly recommend, uh, if you're doing a 10-sided structure, also have a 10-sided hub. And, um, and so I usually I find that the angle is usually about 8 inches uh, down to 7 inches for the hub. So it's about a 23-degree angle for each, sex, each part. And I usually use t t uh, a 2x12 uh, uh, for the hub. Okay. And that's because I'll be putting six inches of earth on uh, for the living roof. And so you have that, that six inches for the, for the rafter and then also another six inches for the earthen uh, floor. Oh, excuse me, for the earthen roof. Um, I don't have a whole lot of video showing the process of attaching your plywood to the rafters that you put on. Um, but basically the way I do it is I get cardboard, okay, and I cut a template using the cardboard and I put that over these the angled rafters, okay? So I, I, I mark cardboard and then I cut a template of the cardboard and then I transfer that template over to the plywood. And I usually use, uh, you can use half inch or five eighths inch, five eighths inch plywood is probably best. I don't see the need for doing three-quarter inch plywood for your roof. Uh, I have done five-eighths and that's been fine. Um, and so, uh, so, yeah, so you'll just try to get the cuts as close as you can. It's a little tricky to doing the cuts around the, the decagon or around the hub. Um, but if you have your cardboard template, you set that down and then you mark that and you have, make sure that that is, looks good then you can transfer that to your your wood and I usually paint the underside of the wood also the, the plywood and you can use a clay paint um, or a lime uh, paint 
or just a regular uh, latex paint, a nice brown latex paint also, if you're okay with using a paint. You can use, and I usually will paint that, and I paint the rafters also. Uh, I usually will paint the rafters kind of like a, a brown color, and then the, the underside of the plywood, usually a, a tan color, right? So, uh, yeah, and I usually use the three inch screws, right? So I, I screw the, the rafters. Uh, first to the the center hub, and then um, and then I screw those to the the top ring around, and you know put a drive a couple screws at an angle um, into that top plate, and uh, and so uh, yeah so hopefully you'll have somebody with some carpentry experience that can help with the roof process okay because again a a round roof can be complicated and so I'll, I'll try to share as much as I can with you to uh, help make it a little easier. Cool. So we are now ready to start the roof for this cabin. It'll be a round roof and round roofs are kind of difficult. It's, uh, it involves a lot of angles and you know, uh, it's kind of figuring things out. So to make things a little easier for you I thought I would just kind of show you um, the process and where what I've done so far um, so, um, so you can kind of get a sense of what's involved. So the first thing you're going to do is you need a hub. We're going to be having a skylight. Um, octagon skylights are very, very expensive and actually difficult to get now. So you can use a square skylight. You can use a square skylight and put that over an octagon hub, right? So uh, yesterday I made this octagon hub. So you can see here, so I'm using 2x10s, um, and, uh, and so I, I, I found the right um, size wood. This is basically for a 21 and a half um, on the inside skylight. This needs to be about 9 inches going down to about 8 inches. And so I kind of made a, a cut, put those all together. And so now this comes out pretty much exactly uh, like 21 and a quarter, but that's good. So now... Once this is up there, this skylight can just plop right down on top of here, right? And so from below, when below looking at this, you would see a nice, you know, it looks like an octagon, right? So that's the first thing. And so then, come on inside. Okay, so we got our hub, and now we are putting it in the center. So I find the best way to do it is to put a couple uh, long, like 12 foot, uh, two by sixes go spanning the distance. And I find a, um, to get to the right height that I want for the slope, uh, I put a, a two by 12 here, uh, a tall bucket, a, a board, a cut like an octagon here. And now I'm gonna go ahead and set this octagon hub right here on top of our form, like that. And I measured it all, got my measuring tape, and I made sure that, you know, this was all the same distance between here and there, and here and there, here and there. And I'm pointing this towards the front, towards the entrance, so this is all kind of parallel um, to the sides. What's making this a little different um, is uh, that you know it's a ten-sided structure? It's ten uh, uprights and ten pallets around, and eight-side octagon. Um, so uh, it'll, the the cuts involved, the angles, um, will will need to compensate for um, for that design. So Tim's here working on. We're getting the roof up, putting in the rafters. It's coming along good. The hammer. That's right. I'm not sure where you put the key to start it though. <laughs> So we pretty much got a great system for putting these blocks in here. It was uh, pretty much at a 20 degree angle, right? And then uh, it's about, it's kind of an inch bevel on the uh, one side is an inch bigger than the other. So I just kind of figured that out. Okay, so a, a very important uh, thing to consider when doing your living roof is you need good drainage, right? 
So you need to be able to have the, the water, when it, once it comes down, to be able to go to the drainage holes. You don't want it just sitting um, at the ends, right? And so, uh, so the technique that I've been using is actually creating a cob channel. You know, create putting cob on the over the plywood on the roof, and create kind of a, a ramp so the water can come and go down uh, to the drainage holes. So take a look at that. You want to have the cob uh, dry up there for at least a week before you put your self-tacking membrane over it. Okay, so uh, so that's that's that. So. Last week, I put this cob on here. This is to create drainage, right? So we have our drainage holes there. I drilled five drainage holes. So there's a drainage hole there, and there's another drainage hole there. And to encourage the water to go exactly where we want it to go, I put this cob channel in here and, put, and let this dry for about a week. And then, so we'll be putting our membrane over this. And then, so the idea is that, so then when water comes down here, It'll hit this channel and just go right down to the drain, right? So that's that. I just found that that's you know, the best way to do it rather than trying to do it with plywood or something. So after we put our membrane in, I'll be putting this um, these drain spouts in here. You know, so I'll just put this here and it'll go right in there. And so at this point, it'll just go straight down. If we want to do a gutter, we might do a gutter, you know, going from there, right? So, and this is the, the membrane here. So it's this stuff, uh, even valley protector, right? So it's a self-packing membrane, right? And it's like this. So we're just gonna roll this out. One side of it has a film that comes off, so it just you know, sticks really easily you know, to the wood. So we'll lay this out. We're doing it just in time because it's supposed to rain tomorrow. So, um, and it has some traction on so we can walk on it easily. And I'll just show you here the skylight so we have our uh, decagon hub and we have a square skylight so this here this can just go straight on top of there right and it's a pretty much a perfect fit it's exactly and so we have the option of if you want the skylight off we can, it can easily be taken off so you can have some open ventilation from the top right so uh, so that's very cool so uh, Alex and I are gonna start putting the membrane on now and then you can see here we got a big pile of this dirt. I got a bunch in back of my truck and a bunch of earth. It's been a planting mix there. And we're going to start putting that on here. We'll put a good, you know, five inches or so of earth on top and then plant our succulents and herbs and strawberries and other fun stuff on the earth. Cool. All right, cool. So we got our membrane on there and I got my little drain uh, spout in the hole. And so let's go ahead and test it out. So I get some water on it. Let's see. So imagine this is a torrential rain. The water just goes right down. And it goes right into those drain spots. Just like that. Perfect. Cool. Okay, so now you have uh, your membrane down over your plywood and you have a nice fascia board around to be able to contain a good five or six inches of, uh, of earth to put on the roof, okay? So, uh, so I usually use a very lightweight uh, earth that has some, um, some perlite, uh, some lava rock, just a... Um, you know, if you're going to do succulents, it wants to be sandy, you want to have, you know, so even some good sandy loam works, but you want to have it, you know, some perlite in there too, so water will uh, drain well. And so, yeah, so I find that succulents are probably the easiest thing to grow on your roof. Um, and succulents, you can just, you know, clip succulents and, and plant them. You want to keep them moist, um, hydrated until they establish themselves. Um, but they're they're pretty pretty simple. Once they're established, you don't really need to do very much. Maybe you water them once a month if that um, in the summertime. But they're 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 very easy to do. Um, you can also just you know, have grasses up there too. You can have strawberries. You can have whatever you want. You know you'll, you'll have a good six inches of earth. Um, you know for the roots to go into. So 
Have fun with your living roof. We are now in the very exciting phase of planting the succulents on our living roof. And so, uh, very, very exciting. So this is the moment we've been waiting for. Yes. And this is in our garden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So exciting and so grateful for the gifts oh, you're that so we, we keep coming across. Yeah. Yeah, the word uh, minga in South America, it's like a work party. It's like a barn raising, like the Amish barn raising. And in the village I was living in, in El Bolson, um, uh, back in 2001, we worked on building a Waldorf kindergarten school out of adobe and cob. And that was really the first earthen structure in Patagonia. They just don't really do earthen structures there. They do a lot of wood and stone and cement. And so, but this earthen school we built inspired this movement called the minga. And, uh, and they started doing these work parties and, and building like nice, big, beautiful houses out of earth. And it got to the point where the local government signed an ordinance to encourage people to do natural building. You know, they listed all the benefits and all the reasons why we should do, you know, use natural uh, earthen built materials for building our structures. So when I went back some years later, there had been over 400 houses built out of earth in this one little village of El Bolson, um, all out of adobe, out of straw bale, out of cob, wattle and daub, pallets, um, you know, because they, you know, they saw that it makes sense and nobody has money there. They're all farmers and musicians and artists and teachers, but you know, they're able to build the way that they are meant to, uh, what makes sense. And uh, they don't have all the strict government requirements and regulations. And, uh, and so I'm hoping that we can kind of evolve here to get to that point where we can um, really, you know, it can become more into the mainstream. And you would think that after all the fires that we've been having and all the awareness of how toxic all these houses are, that we would be able to, uh, you know, be uh, assimilating some of these alternatives, you know, into the mainstream. And it's starting to happen, but um, we just need some more examples. And uh, so I'm excited to, to share this uh, this design of the, the palatable cabin. So again, my, my website is livingearthstructures.com. I have a lot of videos um, and information on my website. And uh, if you wanna you know, drop me a line and come and you wanna participate in a workshop, a natural building workshop, um, I list them on my website. Um, I also have a Facebook page, uh, Living Earth Structures, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm in California, but I, I do, um, I travel, so if, if you want to host a workshop on your property somewhere in, in the States, um, it'd be great to get these spread around, and I also have these on trailers, too. I build palatable cabins on trailers, uh, I call it the, the gingerbread hut, and it's a, it's a two-story, has a little kitchenette downstairs, and an upstairs loft, and it's a, it's a great little structure, and it shows how really durable these structures are, uh, driving down the highway, um, you know, built out of pallets and earth without a crack on it. So that is about it. That's uh, pretty much the process of building a palatable cabin. Okay, so um, let's take a look though on just a, a quick clip so you can see the process of doing a square uh, cabin because it's a whole lot easier. So uh, they work great as a shed, you know, kind of a typical shed is about 8 by 12 or something. Um, so you can use your, your pallets for that. So uh, this is a little clip of the project that I'm doing now in Oakland. Um, so you can see, you know, how, how I framed out um, a, a rectangular one and then we just uh, put uh, two by sixes on the roof and plywood and easy, you know, very, very easy to do a rectangular one uh, opposed to round. So check this out. All right, so we just started doing our clinic here, so we're kind of just first day of, of the clinic build. So I'm just going to share with you uh, kind of how we did the layout and everything. So it's 12 feet. The structure is 12 by 8 feet, right? So that's what our, our floor platform is. You can see we have a space below so a forklift can go underneath and lift it up if it needs to be, right? So pretty much the way it worked out is a four foot, a four foot pallet goes here and you put a four by four in the corners, right? So all the corners get a four by four. So a, a four foot pallet goes here, a four foot pallet goes here, then a two by four goes here, 
and a 40 inch pallet goes here and then the quarter by four here a four foot pallet here and a four foot pallet here with a two by four in the middle and then this is uh, like about 36 about 36 inch pallet right so this is the only kind of unusual size pallet this is a standard 40 inch uh 48 inch right so that's a, a great great kind of uh template system is pretty standardized for a 12 by 8 structure to have um, you know these dimensions right and then the door frame that we have it's a 32 inch uh we have a, it's a preset door and so we're kind of all ready to, to stick our door in here so so now we're ready to start putting in our shelves you know our shelves and we have windows that we're going to frame in and um you know start that so that today and tomorrow we're gonna you know do do the framing and uh and then we're also today we're gonna start we got uh pretty much this side cob we're gonna start putting the cob on this wall here right so we're gonna be you know, covering up our plastic insulation and everything and uh you know doing, doing the cob uh brennan's getting these broken chunks of concrete and putting these along the bottom right so it kind of looks like elephant toes nice uh, <laughs> accentuation 